Good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to our online event tonight uh, with Hillsville Core and uh, the Yarra Valley uh, Community Power Hub. We're delighted to have you here tonight. Um, got a, a huge crowd, uh, and uh, it's lovely to see that so many people have got such a strong interest in heat pumps and renewable energy and uh, in coming along to listen to uh, our speakers and to join us in the, uh, the launch uh, of our community heat pump offer tonight. Um, before we move any further along with the proceedings, I would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land. And I'd also like to pay respects uh, to the elders, both past and present of the Kulin Nation and extend that respect to other indigenous Australians present. We're here tonight um, um, as a consequence of uh, Hillsville Core, a small community energy group uh, in Hillsville, um, uh, being able to uh, uh, get a grant from Sustainability Victoria to set up the Yarra Valley Community Power Hub with five other community energy groups in our region and with our industry partner, uh, Como Energy. And um, we're delighted uh, to be able to uh, present this event uh, with the funding from Sustainability Victoria. And um, of course, um, thank the Victorian government for uh, their creativity in enabling uh, seven community power hubs uh, throughout Victoria to be established, uh, each one with uh, around about uh, just under half a million dollars each uh, for a 12 month project. So um, we're delighted to be here tonight. Um, we have a one and a half hour session and um, the uh, first part of our session is going to be Jonathan uh, Prendergast and uh, Rob Morris uh, talking on a very interesting topic, which we think you uh, might have found intriguing, solar without rooftops. Um, and uh, they will be uh, followed by uh, Chris Taylor, who's from Reclaim Energy. He's a managing director there, and Chris is going to be talking uh, about uh, all things good about the Reclaim Energy heat pump and the community offer uh, that we have going at the moment um, for people in the, uh, the um, wider Yarra Ranges uh, area. Um, the Community Power Hub was, uh, has been established uh, since um, July this year and will run until uh, the end of June next year. Um, the focus of the, um, of the uh, hub is to uh, provide support for the various community energy groups that are in the, the Yarra Valley, the Greater Yarra Valley and Rangers area. Uh, and um, to, through those groups, uh, provide the support that is required to, to run a wide range of uh, community renewable um, uh, events and to help people with uh, offers like the heat pump, solar panels and batteries and, and other projects. Uh, but in particular, through our um, uh, industry specialists, uh, Como Energy, we're, we're looking to um, also get some small to mid-scale solar projects uh, up and running that small community groups would otherwise have difficulty uh, with getting engaged with. And uh, we're currently working with our steering group uh, through the hub um, to, to get these projects up and running. And it's all looking very exciting at the moment with uh, the, uh, the plans that we have um, ahead of us. Um, before I go any further, uh, I'd like to uh, just introduce you to uh, our two speakers for the, the first session tonight, Rob Morris uh, and, jo and Jonathan Prendergast. Um, Rob is the director of IO Energy from Adelaide. Um, there's a time difference there tonight uh, with daylight saving, I think about an hour's difference. Um, uh, in 2019, Rob founded IO Energy uh, and it's helped that business is helping customers to lower their carbon footprint and their power bills uh, through the design, the installation and control of smart appliances and energy storage uh, in the household. Rob has eight years experience as a mechanical and aeronautical engineer in the Australian Army. He has led high performing teams from three to 40 people and his strength is in 
his ability to digest complex problems and design and implement innovative solutions through a combination of new technology and organizational changes. Um, IO's, IO Energy's mission is to help people maximize their use of clean and cheap energy in their home to accelerate the transition to a zero carbon future. So we're on the same page uh, with IO Energy. And Jonathan uh, from Como Energy, as I mentioned, our energy partner, um, and uh, he's an experienced project manager, engineer, and procurement specialist with over 12 years experience in clean energy project developments and investments. Currently, they're providing development services to the community and mid-scale solar sector uh, with current projects uh, in Grong Grong, uh, Haystack Solar Farm, and a Goulburn community-owned solar farm uh, with a, an 800 kilowatt uh, hour battery. And uh, of course, they're now also working with the Yarra uh, Valley Community Power Hub. Como Energy empowers people to take action for a positive climate future and uh, unite people by creating real ways to accelerate the growth of renewable energy in Australia. Um, we're definitely on the same page with Como Energy and uh, uh, what we're on about tonight is exactly what Rob and Jonathan are doing in their work every day. So I'd like to hand you over to Rob uh, and Jonathan, and their session will be around 50 minutes long. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, great intro, and thank you for those very uh, gracious um, bio, bio introductions as well. I'll just get the uh, screen sharing going. So thanks everyone for coming tonight and, and what a great turnout. Um, and I'm not sure if it was the title that, that captured you in, but um, it'd be great to, to hear from you about that. Um, we'd, we'd really love your, your feedback. Um, firstly, this is quite a, a new topic and a new discussion starting to happen in Australia, probably a bit overdue, um, but we're trying to kick that off. And so this is one of the first events I know of talking about this topic around not just generating solar power on our rooftops, but adapting to use that solar to enable more solar and to uh, hasten the change to a renewable grid. Um, also with the, the format, um, we've got shared slides, um, Rob and myself, and just plan to pause on each one and, and have a discussion on each one. And um, so it'd be good to get feedback if you like that format as well. And finally, uh, Rob and I both are day-to-day -day heavily involved in energy and we love the data and the analysis. So we, we'd love that feedback in the chat or on the form that Amanda will provide at the end around whether we hit the right mark, whether it's accessible information or uh, we went a bit too far with the graphs. By the way, I'm flying solo tonight, so I've got kids interrupting. One moment. Unfortunately, uh, I would uh, kick off without Jonathan, but uh, I don't have control of the slides. No, he's back. Here he is. Here you go. Sorry about that. I, I meant to say that up front. Uh, <laughs> the partners' uh, netball season started today. <laughs> um, all right, so let's get into it. Um, yes, and love feedback on um, if we hit the right mark on whether it's understandable and so on. Um, so firstly, um, it's good timing. Australia hit... 3 million households with rooftop solar this week. So that's a landmark achievement. Australians really love solar and have been um, accelerating installations of rooftop solar. You can um, see in this graph here that from 2009 to 2018, we're investing quite a bit in solar and then it even accelerated again. Um, and in terms of the uh, numbers for, for each state, uh, all of them progressing quite well. New South Wales have caught up in recent years. Victoria has been quite steady. Um, Rob, do, would you like to mention that why that sort of take up really accelerated three years ago? Mm, I think, Jonathan, there's probably a, a couple of things there. Um, it would be partly the falling cost um, as uh, I guess as the cost of solar panels just uh, continues to get lower and lower. Um, so the average system cost has come down, but also um, around that 2016, 2017, 2018 period, the uh, 
the wholesale price of energy went sort of astronomical there for a while after the uh, closure of a few uh, few power stations in uh, in South Australia and Victoria. So I guess that combination of cheaper solar and, and rates going up and it just made it uh, became a bit of a no brainer for people getting a sort of payback on their, their investment in in, a, in about three years or so. And also I guess with interest rates being low, it's like you you know get two percent or less or one or two percent. Uh, keeping your money in your bank account or get sort of a 20 20 30 percent return putting into solar and do you think where it's going to keep going like this or where it'll probably start to trail off a bit or where do you think we're up to yeah i think we'll start to see um a bit of a tapering in in some of the states particularly sa in in terms of residential installations we're sort of getting to a bit of a saturation point but uh, i think uh, it'll continue to pick up in, in the larger Sort of business and commercial industrial sector where there's um, still pretty low penetration of solar. I would agree. So on the next slide, um, so this is a, a graph of South Australia's um, electricity. And you can see some demand in the evening um, and then solar comes on and then peak demand, sorry, in, 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 overnight morning and then peak demand in the evening. And during the middle of the day, there's so much solar that it's really reducing the amount of electricity that large scale generators have to generate like coal and gas. And yeah, this I think was a record, wasn't it, Rob? And creates things like minimum operational demand and so on. Would you like to speak to that at all? Yeah, um, good graph there from AMO. It's a, it's rapidly become outdated. I think that minimum's fallen about three more times since then. I think, um, the latest minimums is about 180 megawatts uh, a couple of weeks ago. So, yeah, it's a rapidly changing market. In case we're wondering why we keep talking about SA, even though most of the people here are not in SA, SA, I guess, is sort of out in front leading in terms of the penetration of renewables um, and, and the other states are sort of going to be in that same place in, in a few years' time. So it's, I guess, interesting for us to look at the SA grid as a bit of an indicator of what things might look like in Victoria in, in, a, in, a, couple, in a few years' time. But um, in case anyone's not clear, it's the sort of the top line of that graph is showing what the demand is and basically the yellow bit is how much of that's being met by rooftop solar and the blue is everything coming from the rest of the grid, whether that's wind, gas, imports and, and all that all that other stuff. But basically, as you can see, in the middle of the day, almost all of that energy demand is being met by rooftop solar alone. And it's starting to create, uh, I wouldn't say problems, um, but it's starting to create some, some challenges or problems mm. to be solved, and not unsolvable problems. So one of them is that at a, at a local level, there's so much rooftop solar that um, it increases the voltage on the local lines. Uh, so something for the network to manage or even reverse flows. Um, it's starting to, um, if we don't have those big rotating machines generating much power, you kind of lose that, that AC uh, sine wave signal a little bit. That's called system security. And also that it's creating very low wholesale prices in the middle of the day. And that's, that's going to hold back further investment in, in large scale solar in South Australia. Mm. Yeah, I, I definitely would say um, there's a few challenges. Um, so ultimately, you know, we want to get to up close to 100% renewable grid um, in Australia as soon as possible. And I think South Australia government has a, an aim to be 100% net renewable by, by 2030. And, um, you know, Australia wants to get there as quickly as possible. But um, uh, obviously, the more ro rooftop solar, I guess, eats into the potential market for large scale solar, doesn't it, Jonathan? Because they're effectively sort of generating at the same time. And, and really what we want to see is more demand in the daytime so that um, if we can take all that, all that blue stuff that's, uh, you know, overnight and in the evening and, and shift more of that into the middle of the day, then we can... Um, you know, get more and more of that um, energy usage being powered by solar rather than having it fire up gas and coal power plants to make that demand. So Rob's based in South Australia. This whole presentation isn't, isn't about South Australia. So here's what's happening in Victoria. So this is a few days. So there's a bit of Thursday there, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And the different colours show the different types of generation. So we've got down the bottom, I'm colourblind, but I think that's purple or navy blue. Their imports from other states. The brown is the brown coal generators, your lawn, your lawn and Loyang. And then we've got um, some gas, some hydro, and then the green wind. 
and the uh, yellow solar. So you can see in the evening, the hydro ramps up, um, demand goes low, hydro ramps up again, some solar power, hydro in the evening, uh, demand goes low. Demand is lower on weekends. You can see it's a bit lower than the Friday. But what we saw here was uh, Victoria hit 70% wind and solar supplied. So um, at this time, 70% wind and solar supplied. At that point, they had to export the electricity out to Tasmania, South Australia and, and New South Wales. Um, but quite a remarkable feat. Victoria has really come a, a long way quickly. And I, I think on this day as well, um, it was found that we had so much wind and solar that we had to get some of it to switch down. So the price went very low. It was minus $40 at that moment. And um, wind and solar started uh, dialing itself down. And it was found that um, there was actually enough wind and solar available to hit 99% renewables at that time. So it's not just happening in South Australia and it's starting to happen in, in Victoria as well. Um, and do you see Victoria sort of going as, as quickly as South Australia has the last few years, Rob? Sorry, John. I just had a few technical issues there. What was the That's question right. again? Um, yeah, so with, with Victoria hitting 70 or even 99% mm. wind and solar at times, is Victoria becoming quite similar to South Australia and going at the same transition rate, would you say? Uh, yeah, I, I think it's um, it's on the way there. I guess they've traditionally had both pretty pretty similar um, types of grids. I guess one of the issues you've got there currently in Victoria is you've still got uh, sort of three pretty decent sized coal-fired power stations still ticking along, which um, they're not that easy to turn on and off. Um, the last year or so, we've seen a big change in the way that those coal power stations are operating and they are ramping down a lot more in the daytime. I think Elinta particularly has made quite a substantial investment to make their ground coal power stations more flexible. And you can probably, yeah, see that in that graph, you know, how how how, how that middle of the day, the, the coal generation's down by, you know, about 30% off what it would be overnight. But um, that's probably hitting its minimum there. So you can't really get much more solar and wind in there on that day until you start taking some of those coal power stations out, out of the grid. And South Australia had its last coal power station closed down in about 2016, I think now. So we certainly need storage um, and it's happened a little bit in South Australia and a, a little bit in Victoria as well. Um, there's discussion around increasing the, the linkage with Tasmania. So more can be exported when there's high wind and solar and Tasmanian hydro can be used to meet the peak demands where there's troughs. Um, but all that's going to take some time, isn't it? And it's quite expensive as well. So, yeah, there's um, yeah, it is. Uh, there's no way around to get around the fact at the moment that that uh, storage is more expensive than say building wind or solar. Um, whether you're going for your sort of snowy 2.0 or your battery of the nation, um, there's a lot of sort of capital costs. Although those, once you build it, it's going to be there for for a hundred years. Or you've got your um, you know, your, your battery your battery systems, which are falling in costs, but um, still on the more expensive uh, side for those grid scale batteries. And um, you know, I think there's, you have to probably get out your, your magnifying glass there, Jonathan, to see that light blue or the dark blue um, or light blue battery on that graph. We can see some dark blue hydro doing a fair bit of work, but um, yeah, ba batteries still only making up a sort of tiny percentage at the moment of uh, grid scale. Um, power. All right, so that's the context. Um, so on this slide, we start to show the, the minimum feeding tariffs that the solar feeding tariffs for Victorian households. So it used to be six or five cents. And with the change in wholesale prices that went from four to eight cents, um, we saw uh, Victoria come in with a mandated minimum feeding tariff and they made it 11 cents and then 9 cents and then 12 cents. But that's, that's started to, to drop in the last couple of years, mainly following the wholesale price drop. So if the wholesale price of energy is low, then the, the, the value of that exported solar from rooftops it becomes lower. So now it's down to 6.7 cents. So when I, I think 
I used to give a lot of advice for households and communities and would really encourage people to, to get rooftop solar. And when they said, how much should I get? I would say, well, what, however much your budget can afford and also um, how much you can fit on your roof because feeding tariffs were high and usage charges were high. So they used to be, say, 30 cents per kilowatt hour for a typical usage charge. Um, that's dropped to 20 cents per kilowatt hour. The feed-in tariff was 12 cents. Now it's down to 6.7. The cost of solar um, has come down a little bit, anywhere from 9 to 15 cents or 8 to 14 cents. Um, a bit cheaper now with the Victorian solar rebate and solar becoming cheaper and so on. Um, so... Yeah, what, what, what would your advice nowadays be to a friend or family member getting rooftop solar, Rob? Yeah, it's definitely the advice we give Jonathan is it's all about self-consumption now, um, even more so um, here than in Victoria, that the uh, the value of feed-in tariffs has re really plummeted um, just due to the wholesale. Um, the wholesale price is, is typically around zero during the daytime in South Australia. Um, and it's sort of heading that way in the other states as well. And we'll see some grass later on that. But um, it's all about self-consumption with solar. So you want to size your system um, to meet your own demand and probably expect that you're not going to get that much value from your feed-in tariff. Um, you do want to think about future demand. So whether you're going to be getting an EV or maybe putting in a pool or, or a home battery. Um, so it's good to good to think about that when you when you put in your system because it's probably a bit easier to, to go a bit bigger to start with. But uh, yeah, don't don't expect uh, to be getting too much uh, value for your feed and tariff over the over the life of your system. We'd say to people. Um, so think about your orientation as well. Whether you want to get your system maybe most of it facing to the west to meet that um, sort of late afternoon in the summer when, when demand's typically high and prices are high, um, as well as, uh, you know, through morning morning as well. So, um, yeah, it's about getting the right size and orientation for, for the individual's sort of consumption pattern. Excellent. I, I tend to agree. And rooftop solar, solar is still a great thing, but de definitely size it to your needs and, and try and use as much of it as possible because... If it costs eight to 14 cents and you're only getting six cents in the grid, then you're running at a bit of a loss. And also that, that rate is likely to decline in the future if it sort of follows this declining trend. And I think this graph really sums it up. It's a, a bit old, as you said, but a graph that Rob, a graph that Rob made comparing uh, the wholesale electricity price in South Australia from September 2019 to September 2020. There might have been reasons why this month in 2020 was lower than 2019, but it is things are changing quickly. But you start to see a lot of negative prices for solar farms, wind farms supplying at this time. Um, have you have you found a good way of explaining negative prices, Rob? I guess to, uh, if you generate and supply that... <laughs> at this time, if you generate and supply at this time, you actually effectively are paying to generate at that time aren't you mm. doesn't make a whole lot of uh sense i guess until you yeah to the, to the typical person but um there's a there's a wholesale spot market where all the the big energy generators and the big energy buyers trade energy through the energy market operator through the federal government um and that just makes up one of the costs for for that's where your retailer buys the energy and they sell it to you because they got to pay them pay to pay the poles and wires and, and that sort of stuff as well but uh, yeah, as um as demand gets lower and lower, there's there's lots little demand and lots of supply in the daytime, so you do see those prices tipping into the negatives. And part part of that is because um, solar and wind farms do get a subsidy, so even at negative forty dollars, they're still probably breaking even there. Um, and uh, also, it was probably just took the market by a bit of surprise there, and um, some of the bidding strategies just just weren't accounting for the fact that uh, prices could go negative. And I think over time we'll, we'll probably see, see still low pricing, but probably not, not so much of those sharply negative um, prices because it, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to be paying to generate energy when you, when you could just be switching off, does it, Jonathan? Indeed. Um, which leads us to um, the next slide. So what Rob's company, IO Energy, has done is created um, a new electricity retailer just based in South Australia. Um, and what it's trying to do is set uh, tariffs at different times of the day uh, to encourage energy electricity use at, at the right time. So this, this first graph shows uh, overnight power 
at around 18 cents per kilowatt hour, uh, morning and evening power at 36 cents per kilowatt hour, and then daytime electricity costs for usage at 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's one of your plans. And then on the right, you've got even this plan here where between 10 and 3 p.m., you charge your customers only seven cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and I guess the, the point of this is to try and uh, get people using more power in the middle of the day and um, both to, for them to save money, but also to help soak up all this wind and solar because if we shift more of our demand, if it's hot water, dishwashing businesses or EV charging into the middle of the day, that means we can actually continue investing in more wind and solar, not have to wait for storage and snowy and, and the Tasmanian connection, the Basslink 2. We can actually keep building. Is that kind of the premise of what you're trying to do? Yeah, it's essentially that's what it is. Um, we've seen that the market has, has changed and, and energy is getting cheaper in the daytime. Um, and that's both on the wholesale level and also with the energy networks. And the networks are the ones who move the energy around the place through poles and wires. And um, they're starting to see, you know, more and more solar coming to the grid. Um, it's about 40% of residential houses have solar, so four out of 10 in South Australia. And your typical rooftop solar system that goes in now generates enough power to, to supply about 10 to 20 houses at, at midday. Um, if you think most houses use about a quarter to half a kilowatt during the daytime and, and your system's generating sort of five, five kilowatts. So you're supplying about 10 to 20 houses worth of energy. And if you think out of those 10 to 20, four out of, four out of every 10 also have their own solar system, we can see pretty quickly that there's a lot more a lot more solar sloshing around the grid in the daytime than is really needed at a local level. And, and that, that causes some, some, some localised problems. And what the energy networks are trying to do is go, hey, we've got plenty of supply in the daytime. Let's offer um, low tariffs. So that's three SA power networks. Um, and we, as a retailer, are saying, let's grab that and let's pass it on to our customers. And the tariff on the right is um, based on a trial tariff that we worked with SA Power Networks to, to design, particularly to, to make power as cheap as it possibly can be in the middle of the day and comparatively expensive in, in, in the evening. Um, it does, you know, it sounds pretty steep there, your 95 cents, but we've actually found that there's an incredible ability for customers to change um, their usage pattern. And, and people think you can't use energy in a day to work nine to five, but it's actually relatively easy. For most people to, or for many people to change that, um, I would say personally, we, we use about 70% of our energy between 10 and 3 uh, in my house and we use under 5% between 5 and 9. So there's a few strategies. We, we run our, our pool pump and pool heating always on time as in the day. We run our heating and cooling before we get home. So you come home to a, a warm house that's cost you almost nothing to heat and you don't need to run it through the peak. Um, and, and things using like delay timers on, on dishwashers and washing machines, which pretty much all devices come with these days um, in the process of getting a home battery installed as well to, to, to be able to soak up more of that cheap power and avoid the expensive rates in the evening. And the, the good news is um, that this is also available in, in Victoria, not IO Energy, but the, the, the poles and wires companies, and I'm, I'll concentrate on Osnet because I think most mm. of the attendees will live in the Osnet area, have started to, to offer lower rates. So um, I, I, I won't go into all the Osnet tariff sheets because these tariff sheets by uh, network companies, you can tell they're all engineers. There's thousands of numbers everywhere. But to summarise, um, Osnet's tariffs um, uh, th these are network tariffs that are included in the charges you pay. So if you're paying 20 cents per kilowatt hour on a flat rate or 25 cents, 13.4 of those cents go to the poles and wires company. So your retailer just shows you one rate, but that rate is made up of network charges and generation costs, retail costs, and, and other AMO and environmental charges. But they now have this uh, two rate plan where um, from 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. each day you pay peak and the rest of the time is off peak. Um, so it's quite innovative and it's just happened July 1st. Um, they've been modifying their network tariffs in, in line with this sort of discussion. And it's 22.9 cents per kilowatt hour, 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. and 4.8 cents per kilowatt hour off peak. So in your seven cents, Rob, what is the, the poles and wires SAPN, South Australian Power Networks charge around 
two or three cents, that solar sponge special tariff? Yeah, it's, a, it's yeah. about two. So of that seven, uh, about a cent of that is, is GST. About two cents is um, is uh, for, for the, the poles and wires. There's a couple of cents of market charges in there, um, a couple of cents of, um, of uh, wholesale costs and, and uh, you know, maybe a cent or so of margin in there. Most of the margins out outside that daytime. So, so it's thirteen point four cents per kilowatt hour. But if you average out for over twenty five percent of the time, is twenty two cents and seventy five percent is four point eight cents. It lands on nine point three cents. So, mm. if you just used electricity at a flat sort of constant level, you would you would get ahead using the two rate system. Obviously, if you can shift your load um, into the off peak and use less peak, you can get that average down even more. And some of the retailers in um, Victoria are starting to reflect these with some very cheap off-peak. When I initially came up with the, the concept of this uh, presentation, I, I thought I had found Elysian offering 9.9 .9 cents per kilowatt hour, and that's from 9 p.m. Um, overnight then all day through to 3 p.m., so 75, um, well, 18 hours a day at 9.9 .9 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, I can see that's not there anymore when I searched whatever um, earlier in the week to, to finalise these slides, but got Glowbird landing at 12.8 cents per kilowatt hour for 75% of the time in Osnet. So re really cheap power. And I remember people over the years have said, oh, electricity is so expensive in Australia. Like I've got a cousin in the US or Canada that only has to pay 12 cents per kilowatt hour. And they're in US or Canadian dollars. And you can start to see that that's actually starting to happen here. We've got the wholesale prices back under control and we're adjusting our network prices um, to, to reflect the cheapest time to use energy. So with a bit of effort and um, some skill and maybe some automation that Rob is doing, um, we can really, everyone can reduce our electricity costs. Um, and that brings me on to, to hot water. And I think, Rob, you said in this earlier slide there was, a, a, you mentioned to me yesterday, there's a kick up here at, at 11, 11 o'clock. Would you like to describe that? Mm. Yeah, it's actually probably least pronounced there. And if we looked at the average over the whole year, you'd see it much more uh, pronounced there with the, um, it's not uncommon for the most expensive dispatch period of the day to be midnight in South Australia, which I guess is uh, 11.30 if we go by the energy market time with the time shift. And the reason for that is because there's about 200,000 um, household hot water systems all turning on at exactly the same time. Um, and uh, they're putting a lot of demand on the grid because hot water uses um, a fair old uh, whack of power. Um, so it's a bit of a historical thing that all the hot water systems were set to come on at midnight. You know, you want to have a bit of demand to help keep the uh, coal power stations running overnight, but we haven't had coal power in South Australia for, for quite a while now. So it doesn't make any sense. We should be running them in the daytime, um, but we're not. And that's why you see high demand and high prices at midnight, which doesn't make much sense. But so I, I did the sums for Victoria. Uh, so 2.5 million homes, and they're all using a, a wide variety of different hot water systems, whether it's instantaneous gas or gas tank, electric, solar, hot heat pump, and so on. But hypothetically, if they all switched away from gas to electric hot water, and let's just say they were using electric resistive element hot water, typical tank hot water, um, that would be around eight kilowatt hours per day, the electric hot, hot water system that uses, give or take. Um, that adds up to 20 million kilowatt hours per day in Victoria, or 7,300 gigawatt hours per annum. And Victoria uses around 50,000 gigawatt hours per annum. So if we did that, that would add up to 15% of Victoria's electricity usage just in hot water for homes. And that's why I've called this hot water, home hot water. It's a big deal. And the way I look at hot water is it's a, a really cheap battery. Um, so with a, a, like a Tesla Powerwall battery or similar, you soak up your daytime cheap electricity for use in the evening. And a hot water tank is similar at, you can charge the hot water uh, when you want to, say in the middle of the day, uh, like I've shown graphically here to soak up solar, and then you can use it throughout the day. 
Um, and and I think you're doing some work on on hot water with IO Energy as well, eh? Yeah, we're um we're definitely uh, in the process of uh, shifting um, as much of our customers' hot water loads as we can to the daytime. Um, it uh, it currently um, about eighty percent of households um, have don't have smart meters in South Australia, which is a bit different. In, in Victoria, 100% of houses do have smart meters. So we're a bit behind um, in all the other states than where you are in Victoria. But uh, what that means is they've got an old sort of mechanical timer and, and you can't actually really change how that works. So um, if customers, we get them to put in a smart meter, that means we can we can set the hot water system to come on at different times, basically when, when we want it to, to be optimal for the, the customer's energy price. Um, and so that's what we're doing. We're shifting the customers to, to run their hot water mostly in the day. If they're big big users, we run it a bit on the, the overnight race as well outside of that peak time. Um, and we're working with the, the metering providers to, to be even smarter with how we use hot water. So it might be a matter of turning your hot water system on for, on for five minutes, off for five minutes, then on for an hour. And basically, you know, if a, cloud, a big cloud comes over and cuts out most of the solar power in the state, we can we can turn off all the hot water systems to, to avoid the need to fire up a bunch of gas power generators to meet that demand. Because ultimately, people don't really care when the hot water system's turning off and on. They just want to have a hot shower, you know, in the morning when they get up or, or at the end of the day. So they, we basically say, leave it up to us and your metering provider. We'll make sure you get hot water and we'll pick the optimum times to run that to keep costs low and, and uh, use as much renewables as we can. Just to show that really sort of um, round out this point, um, this is a, a graph of, of Rob's showing his, his customers overnight or nighttime hot water, which is controlled load operated by the network. Um, and here is my poor graphic design attempt to show that we could use our electricity for our hot water sort of in the evening at, at A, or we could um, shift as much as possible um, to soak up that that day daily solar generation and really allow more and more solar gen generation by I think um, Victoria is up to about ten percent solar at the moment. To think that uh, another fifteen percent could be soaked up by changing when we when how how we make hot water and when we do it it's quite phenomenal. Hmm. Um, did you have any other thoughts on these two graphs, Rob? Um, yeah, we've, uh, yeah. so this is some work we did uh, uh, when we're working with our smart meter provider around modelling how, how we're going to shift the energy usage on a sort of individual customer basis. And I think that was the before shot and I'll, I'll get you at some point and after to show where we are now with, with uh, most of that load being shifted uh, to be running in the daytime, which is, uh, which is good. Yeah, and I'm, I'm more of a fan of kind of low tech, just... Put it on in the middle of the day, if it if it is coming, um, if it's it's mostly going to be solar across the year. But mm. it's an interesting point you make because there was that day about six months ago where a huge cloud and rain band came across South Australia and took out like 600, 800 megawatts of solar. And AMO, um, the market operator, um, spent a lot of their time on weather, uh, even before wind and solar. Um, so they're, they're experts in weather as much as they are electricity. <laughs> um, mm. So they, they saw it coming and had diesel and, and gas on standby ready to ramp up and meet that demand when the solar dropped away. But as you say, you could just, um, if you had smart controls of the hot water, you can modulate that. And you also mentioned that there's a bit of a peak when the hot water first turns on and mm. it drops away. So you could get all the hot water systems if you were orchestrating a million of them to come mm. on at slight, slightly staggered times and, and deliberate times to soak yeah, up renewables. Exactly. Well, well as, as you sort of see from your labelled B there on the right, like that's a bit of the sort of ramping up and then ramping down again would require a bit of orchestration because if you just say everything come on at 10 a.m., you're going to have a massive spike and then you'll see it tail off um, after that. But what, what you really want is, you know, for those customers that need the full five hours of heating, they have big, big family, big demand yet you start them at 10 and, and run for the whole period some other people only need two hours of heating per day so you run those ones say 11 a.m to 1 p.m and, and you, then you can achieve that kind of matching the hot water load to an actual solar output optimally yep um so 
here's um, a list of most of the hot water options. There's probably a couple I've missed. So typically, a electric resistive tank is used to be very common, uh, one to two thousand dollars. They're, they're good storage. They do use a lot of power, um, but a smart Asterix electric resistive tank, um, and about five hundred dollars for for a timer or some sort of smart control. Uh, instantaneous uh, electric, probably justifiable instantaneous if it's like at a holiday house or a very small usage that doesn't get used that much. Um, they use a lot of power and then definitely on your 95, your seven cent and 95 cent plan, you wouldn't want electric instantaneous or you just wouldn't want to have any, use any hot water on that 95 cent plan because that could become very expensive. Mm. Now heat pumps, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of heat pumps and uh, Jeff and Chris are launching the bulk buy later. Um, and a reason I, I like heat pumps is because um, I have a battery as well. And some days there's just not that much solar and you struggle to charge the battery fully. It only happens five days a year or something in Sydney, maybe a bit more in Melbourne and, and, and uh, the Yarra Ranges. Um, so I like that heat pumps are so efficient, whereas uh, electric tank uses eight kilowatt hours a day, heat pumps only use two. And it means there's always enough solar to charge the battery or there is generally more. That said, if you, if daytime electricity is becoming so cheap, you can always top up uh, your electric tank if from the grid in the middle of the day just to, just to um, and not affect the battery and so on. It, importing is less of a big, big deal anymore in the future. Um, so Russell makes the, the point in the chat that heat pumps don't like to be turned on and off, and I, I, would, I would really agree with that. Um, I think resistive tank elements are, are very suitable for smart controls. You can change them from one kilowatt to four kilowatts, and they're very robust like that. Heat pumps are running a fan and a compressor, and you wouldn't want to be switching them on and off multiple times through the day. Could you still have a heat pump connected to some sort of smart control system that could maybe just switch off at, at those moments when solder's dropping away, do you think, Rob? Yeah, I, I, I certainly could. Um, you just wouldn't want to be doing the sort of really rapid uh, changes in, in usage. Um, but, yeah, your, your heat pump, you could definitely um, be, be smarter in the way that operates. Um, but, uh, yeah, you, you're typically just going to, um, with your heat pump, that you... You're not using that much power. You, if you're running in the day off your solar, then you're already doing pretty well there. So gas we're less favouring of because you can't get uh, you can't do renewable power for a, for a gas hot water system. Mm. Solar hot water um, has a great history in Australia. Um, I guess in line with this presentation, uh, the the challenge I would have with solar hot water is when it's when there's lots of solar about it, it's warm, it's in summer. You get great hot water, um, but for those one, two, three, four months where it requires boosting, that's likely to happen at the end of the day. It's going to be using; it's not going to be using the solar power from the grid. So I, I would kind of favour having that standard heat pump or or, or electric tank uh, hot water going every day and soaking up the solar compared to solar hot water needs electricity from the grid just when you have a shortfall of solar power. So it, mm. it's kind of uh, magnifying that effect. Um, I'd love you to tell the story, Rob, about how you, you want to get for your home an electric resistive tank, but it's, but it's illegal. <laughs> mm. Is that right? It, it is actually a strange law we have in South Australia, which basically says if you are connected to the gas grid you can't have an electric resistive um hot water system um you uh you you're, you're sort of limited you can you can put in a heat pump um or, or you can put in gas and most people sort of go well i can either spend a thousand on gas or i've already got gas or i can spend you know quite a bit more on a heat pump um one of the other unfortunate things jonathan is there's um there's some subsidies available for heat pumps in South Australia, pretty about a thousand dollars off. But because I'm connected to the gas grid, I'm not eligible for the subsidies either. So it makes the heat pump not really a good option and kind of forces me down the road of getting, getting, uh, staying with gas. I've only been here nine months, so I haven't changed yet. But I have found there's actually a loophole. Someone told me recently, Jonathan, and what I have to do is I've got to disconnect 
from the gas grid, clamp, clamp it, get it all disconnected, then I am, can technically claim my heat pump subsidy, which is what I'll be doing soon. So, so you've got to line a few things up, get the heat pump, shut off the gas, and then get the subsidy all within a certain period so you can get it. Yeah. Yeah. Might have to go. Might might have to go a few days, a day or so without hot water. That's why I've been waiting for the summer to get it done. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or a hol- holiday. I'll, I'll go. I'll go for a swim <laughs> instead of um, showering. But, but it's amazing that you know. I think I wonder if other people on, on in the event tonight agree. But through our explanation, we feel that option two and four are the, the most renewable, sustainable, um, energy system friendly systems to get. Mm. Yeah. Um, and that um, you can get all of those except for one of them that, that we, we favour um, according to regulation. And I, I think that so you can have a tank if it's already there from 30 years ago or something, but you just can't get new tanks or switch to tanks. Is that, is that right? Uh, yeah, it, I'm yeah. not sure what the rule is in Victoria. It, yeah, in SA, if, um, if you're not on the gas grid, so if you live regionally or up in the up in the hills or whatever, um, there's no reticulated gas. You can put in electric, but if you can get gas, they technically say you can't put in an electric resistive resistive system. Um, and it's basically when they brought the rule in, um, the South Australian grid was mostly running on coal. Um, it uh, it sort of made sense. Like electricity was pretty dirty and expensive, and gas was really cheap, and and they sort of favoured people towards putting in gas, but now with a high renewable grid getting up to close to 70%, it's just vastly more environmentally friendly to have um, to have electric of any type, whether it's a heat pump or resistance, it is vastly better than um, than gas and both environmentally and cost wise. So we uh, have been doing a bit of a uh, bit of quiet lobbying on that front. Um, there's, there's some changes afoot around those things, but at the moment we're sort of uh, stuck to finding loopholes in the rules. Yeah. And um, later with Jeff and Chris, we'll be launching the Reclaim heat pump. Reclaim's one of the, the higher end heat pumps. It's got a lot of advantages. So it's, it's well made as a heat pump. It can operate mm. at a wider range of temperatures. So it doesn't need an electric booster for like really cold times. It also uses CO2 as a refrigerant, uh, which is much more climate friendly. A lot of the other ones use refrigerant that um, has high global warming potential. Uh, so when it leaks, um, it's very, very poor for climate change. They're very quiet. I think um, Reclaim also has that handy um, um, panel where you can easily set what time it turns on and off and so on. Um, Russell, Russell writes in the chat, Rob, he's, he's, he's keen to get you to Victoria and Osnet. He's, uh, so you've got a first interested customer from Victoria based on tonight's discussion. Uh, oh, just a couple good. of slides. <laughs> <laughs> So just a couple of slides to go. So this isn't just uh, myself and Rob having our personal point of view. Um, this is starting to happen globally. So a guy called uh, an Australian famous inventor, entrepreneur, Sol Griffiths, worked on the Rewiring America project in the US. Um, so bringing infrastructure home, they recently announced this significant policy. They, they have furnaces for heating in the US, but water heaters, stoves, they account for 95% of residential building emissions, but they're only replaced every 10 to 25 years. So that's a major, major motivation is if the neighbor, a friend, family member buys a, a gas unit now, it's probably going to be there for 10 or 25 years. So we have, really have to act urgently on, on, on getting this advice out there. They also find it's going to be a huge uh, jobs creator, um, switching over to electrify everything, electric electric heat pump heating, electric heat pump hot water, induction stovetops, create huge amount of jobs directly and and indirectly, and also save households money, so $377 per annum. And they're looking at rooftop solar, electric vehicles, induction cooking, um, heat pumps for space heating, heat pump for hot water. So... Luckily, Sol's um, back in Australia now, and you might have seen him in various ABC and, and other articles um, promoting all the great research analysis and, importantly, the messaging and marketing over from the US to Australia. I think they've really nailed it, and it's a, a movement worth getting behind. Have, have you followed it at all, Rob? Yes, very closely. Um, it's uh, it's pretty amazing 
to see what uh, what Sol's done there. Um, over in the US was re- rewiring America and has been an advisor to presidents uh, over there. And now he's uh, now he's moved back to Australia. So uh, he's started rewiring Australia and he's almost got wall to wall media coverage lately, hasn't he? You, you can't turn on the TV and not see Sol. So he's uh, he's a really great great promoter for electrification and it's uh it's just it's just such low-hanging fruit for for that um sort of decarbonizing the economy it is things like water like appliances um like evs and that sort of thing and just getting getting everything at, at the moment your typical household uses three types of fuel and you use about you know a third electricity a third gas and a third um petrol and diesel to, to to run your life and if you can make that down to one fuel source which is electricity and and get everything on all electric and then make it all renewable you, you're sort of a long way to solving the the climate problem at least at the household level which is which is a very significant across the whole economy very significant carbon emitter so love his work um i just want to see more of it and more quickly absolutely so to try and sum up our presentation tonight I, th- I think it's fairly simple. So how do you reduce your bills and how do you, well, reduce emissions and, and use more renewable energy? So firstly, it's around the right technology. So hot water heat pumps, CVs, induction stove tops, pumps for, hot, for, for space heating, the right electricity plan. If you're, if you're willing to, to get involved and be a, a really active and engaged uh, consumer and, and use more renewable, um, you can save money by finding the right plan for you. If it's that off-peak rate, you can shift more energy after 9 p.m. and before 3 p.m. And all, so you and all, finally using electricity at the right time. So a fairly simple combo. Um, not everyone's going to be like Rob and I watching the live electricity market and adapting when we use power and when we don't, and so on. But I think most people can can get somewhat in, involved in this and become a more active member of, of the grid as it transitions to our renewables. Um, so time for, for any questions. Um, Jeff can um, suggest how much time we've got and if we've kept up or not. But I maybe one for you, Rob, if, if you know the answer. But um, I think I've got an answer for it too. But Peter Nielsen writes, how about a thermosiphon solar uh, heater feeding a heat pump? Um, sounds like a, a good efficient solution i guess making the most of both i guess just the question i'd have is around costs because then you're sort of doubling up your cost you, you paint your, your your solar and your heat pump so probably you might not stack up on a cost basis but uh if um if you want to do it then um go for it i also think like the other solutions are kind of off the shelf and you can mm. get the product supplier and the installer to take the risk that it will be installed okay, will operate and last the time. I think that that's to me more of a, um, a sort of a passion project of someone quite technical and, and passionate, um, t- willing to take on a bit of risk and, and pioneer a little bit to test things, but um, it would be very efficient, that's for sure. <laughs> Uh, were there any other questions in there? Zarina's linked uh, to Rewire Australia. So they've repeated, I feel like we're piggybacking on the US a bit. They've invested heavily in doing the research, working out what marketing and, and messaging will help mainstream um, mm. all, all this stuff. And we can just bring that to Australia um, and, and piggyback off it. But it's a fantastic website if anyone wants to have a look and, and, and join their mailing list. So we've got a couple of questions. Simon Prunster. Uh, hi, Simon, by the way. <laughs> um, he's in the Oznet region and have an off-peak hot water system. Can this be reset to daytime rather than coming online at midnight? I'll, I'll just um, talk about my experience first. So I got a heat pump first, then I got solar. And the heat pump was operating on... Um, when, I, when I changed our resistive to heat pump, it was kept on the controlled load circuit, which yours would be on, Simon. When I got the solar, I had to get a level two electrician to change over the meter. And I said to him, hey, while you're here, can you switch my heat pump from the controlled load uh, circuit over to the main circuit? Um, and he, he did that for me uh, for an extra 50 bucks or whatever. Uh, so I think any electrician can do that. Um, and then I set up the timer on the heat pump to be um, during the daytime. 
So he's got, Simon would have an electric resistive, so you'd have to install a timer as well. So I've done that at my uh, family holiday house. I got an electrician to install a timer there and we get that going in the middle of the day. So I think it's all possible, um, need an electrician to do so. Uh, Gina asks, what do you recommend for Upper Yarra Valley, which is cold and heavily treed, lots of shade? Do you want to answer that, Rob? Um, are, we, uh, are we talking in terms of sol rooftop solar there, Gina? Or, um, yeah. So it might yeah. be an inability, inability to get rooftop mm. solar. And I guess, I guess this is a test of whether we met the headline of this event. Mm. Have we made it clear how you can go solar without rooftop solar? <laughs> yeah, so uh, everyone's got to sort of do the sums for their own individual situation. But, I mean, personally, uh, I've been in my house for about nine months and I, I've looked pretty hard at uh, installing solar. But the, the main sort of spot on my roof where I can do it is a west-facing roof and I've got a, a huge sort of 200-year-old, gigantic, beautiful gum tree in the backyard. Um, which pretty much keeps my roof in shade all afternoon. Um, as yeah, So it's just um, would make it a very probably marginal to poor um, in, investment there for me personally. If, if there wasn't, you know, it's great to have a tree there. If that wasn't there, um, I probably would put a big, big west-facing solar system on um, because particularly that helps avoid late, late summer afternoons, that sort of demand you've got for cooling when prices are typically really high. That works well, but um, yeah, it doesn't make an awful lot of sense to put in solar if, if you've got lots of shading on your roof. Um, and what we would recommend then is to look at how you can get the best electricity tariff, which might give you some cheap daytime power, um, you know, effectively using solar from your neighbours and um, invest your money instead in, in things like a heat pump and, and things in like electrifying your house and changing the way you use energy, maybe some smart devices and that sort of thing to shift it out of the peak time, that three to six, and even possibly looking at a home battery um, that you could uh, potentially charge at a cheaper rate maybe and, and avoid um, that peak time. Um, but, yeah, there's uh, I'd have to sort of be based on the individual's sort of electricity rates there. Yeah, so yeah. certainly... Um, in terms of an action plan, it would be to try and electrify as much as possible, hot water, electric stovetop, um, space heating with a heat pump, um, and trying to modulate when you use that power and find the best plan that makes um, um, solar in the middle of the day really cheap, cost-effective. So it's only just starting to happen with the, the cheap rates that I showed. I'll, I'll link in... Um, the website where I got that, uh, whatever.com.au. Um, um, and th that's where I got that, that, that electricity tariff information. Um, and to keep an eye on that, get the best plan where you can tap into those 12 cents per kilowatt hour. But as Rob said, every case is different. And certainly in more ro remote areas, uh, you might have to rely on a diesel generator as backup occasionally. It's, it's a bit of a di different situation. Um, we're, we're sort of talking to, to the 90% of homes and, and each case can be a little bit different. Mm. Uh, Stuart asks if, if batteries are cost effective yet. Uh, I'll let you go first, Rob. They definitely can be in, in the right situation. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, particularly if you're able to get a subsidy, um, we had customers um, of ours that were able to tap into the SA's government $6,000 subsidy. So they were able to get a Tesla Powerwall for, for only $7,000 uh, about a year ago. Now a Tesla Powerwall, the price has gone up and the subsidies come down. So now one of those would be sitting you back at 15 grand. Um, so that sort of significantly changes the, <clears throat> the economics. And, and I guess we had, we've got customers that are able to pay that investment back in sort of under five years for something that's probably going to last them 15 um, with that subsidy. Um, the, there are some other well-priced batteries on the market. Um, it still can uh, make sense for the right person on the right plan. Um, batteries can stack up. Um, increasingly, I think you will see um, as solar feed and tariffs come down, um, you're basically going to be charging your battery for free and those peak rates are sort of shoot, shooting up. Um, I think increasingly you're going to see um, batteries make more and more sense for people. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of what the price is and, and what happens with supply and demand as well. 
Uh, Gina's happy with our reply, so I'm relieved about that. Um, John mentions uh, Amber Electric is an interesting electricity retailer in that they pass through the wholesale electricity price and hence variability. Good if you can use power during the daytime. And uh, John, I'm, I'm with Amber, and that's why I mentioned I do follow the wholesale rate and have kind of switched off my solar at times and it goes too negative. I've turned everything on um, at other times and turned everything off at other times. Um, saves me $4 a year probably doing that. So <laughs> um, I'm not sure it's worth my time um, at that level. Um, I guess it'd be interesting to hear from you, uh, Rob. So you, you would favour um, more sort of daily fixed tariffs to mm. encourage the right uh, behaviour rather than half-hour tariffs. And I'm, I'm sure you would agree they're both good ideas. Yeah. It would be interesting to hear from you why you favoured more this fixed tariff plan mm. in the middle of the day. Was no, there a I do, reason? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I do uh, love what Amber are doing um, when we were sort of in early stage of our business, I, I tried it out for a while and I think it can be really good. And it's probably for, for, for someone who really wants to optimize and is going to be checking that app and doing all that sort of thing, your opportunity to get the absolute lowest is going to be on a wholesale rate, but it does require you to get the most out of it to be quite a bit of an energy nerd there. Um, I know personally at the time I was, um, uh, I, was, I had a couple of housemates and, and I actually ended up paying $100 in one day for power with, with Amber. Um, the price shot up to the market cap in, in a heat wave and, and my, my housemates were at home cranking the air gone flat out for, for a few hours. So um, I guess at that, at that point uh, and just sort of the, the fear of paying those sort of astronomical prices for power, um, even though you know over the year you're going to be better off, and even as an energy nerd, I sort of thought that there's there's a great market for that wholesale pricing, but it's always, I think, going to be a sort of niche of, of those people that are really keen on that sort of thing. So what we wanted to do with Iowa Energy is be for a bit more of your sort of every every person or every household where we offer cheap daytime power, maybe not in the zero or negative, but pretty cheap every day. And you just know every day I'm getting this, and and you can change your behaviour. We think. Um, Changing behaviors about forming habits. And if you have a habit of always running a dishwasher on a three hour delay, you set it in the morning, you go boom, 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 three hours, um, that's sort of more likely to get that behavioral shift rather than having to sort of think a lot about it. Um, so we think that sort of behavioral um, for habit forming and also being able to set things like fixed timers um, and also in the back end, some automations that we can do behind the scenes as a retailer. Um, so yeah, definitely love the. Love the work that uh, Dan and Chris there are doing at Amber. Uh, really awesome to see a innovative Aussie business disrupting the energy industry. Um, and uh, yeah, it's um, definitely for, for someone that's willing to keep a really close eye on, on what the wholesale market is doing. It's a one to check out. Fantastic. So Jess screen back is back on. I presume that means we're, we're coming to time. Um, yes, uh, time to bring it to an end now. Just made it, it looked a bit risky with my kids uh, playing up before, but they, they quietened it down. We made it through the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, Rob and Jonathan, thank you both very much for a very interesting and stimulating uh, presentation. Uh, and uh, it sort of uh, starts to bend the mind a little bit when, when we uh, start thinking in, in the way that, uh, that you're talking uh, tonight. Um, but uh, interesting to know how... Uh, as we get more and more renewable energy, particularly solar energy, uh, this sort of thinking starts to, to come on board from energy nerds like yourselves. Uh, and uh, it's good to have you presenting to we people who don't try and save $4 a year by switching our solar on and off. Mine's on all the time. I never switch it off. I wouldn't know how to. But uh, thank you both for a very interesting uh, presentation. I'm, I'm sure people uh, got a lot out of that.